Um, so today we're going to continue on chapter five after kind of doing a little bit of an intro last week of like the types of classification models, at least of um, relatively simple classification models. Um, and get into more like how to evaluate it and how to deal with deal with things. Um, I guess before we get started, uh, we only have two chapters left. Uh, chapter six is st statistical machine learning. And then number six, chapter seven is unsupervised learning. Um, I don't think we have those uh, sorted out yet. So if you're interested in presenting those, please, um, you know, let, let me know uh, soon, because otherwise we're going to have to prep chapter six. Um, but we will, you know, just a couple more weeks, maybe two weeks per chapter. We'll see how it goes as we get into them. Um, all right. So continuing chapter six or chapter five, rather, uh, the parts we're going to talk about today is that we want to evaluate the classification models and we want to deal with imbalanced data. There are also a couple of other things um, kind of blended in there that they didn't really call out as super important. And some of them, I don't know, I think they gave them they gave a couple of things I found really interesting, like a paragraph. So we'll see how that goes. All right, so we talked about types of models last week. We can talk more about them uh, at the end if people have more thoughts, but we'll come back to that. So, all right, um, there's, you know, a lot of this chapter is about evaluating classification models. Um, I went through and uh, like noted all the yardstick functions for this because they show you how to like write it yourself in base R and yeah, it's not that hard, but also yardstick exists and just will do all these calculations. Um, first off, we have accuracy. That's, you know, true. Uh, like how, how true is it? <laughs> um, your true values, true positives and true negatives divided by your total. Uh, that's the really straightforward. Um, I don't show a confusion matrix because I couldn't get one together real quick. Uh, but the yardstick will do a confusion matrix. The general idea of a confusion matrix is you have columns are predictions and rows are the actual or vice versa. And then the diagonal is correct classification. Um, confusion matrix are particularly helpful, I think, when you have a multi-class problem because you can see like of the ones that are supposed to be class one how many are cl classified as class two class three etc which again i should have shown one here but i don't um so yeah that's the basic idea of confusion matrix it, it uh gives you a quick visual kind of summary of all these other stats that we're going to talk about is the nice thing about a confusion matrix so all right next we've got recall or sensitivity um, I think it's helpful to think of this as out of the the true things and true positives, how many did the model remember? So like if you think of true positives as a fact, how many facts did it remember? Um, and that is yardstick recall. And I, I say it that way just to kind of link to where the heck did this name come from? Um, but it's all only dealing with the positives, true positives divided by actual positives. Um, specificity, how good is the model at picking out bad things? So that's your, how many of, what percentage of the, the negatives did you see? So true negatives divided by uh, the ones that you failed to classify as negatives. And then precision, what portion of the things that you predicted uh, are true? So out of your true positives, uh, or your true positive divided by all of your positives in the model. And again, Yardstick has these all as functions. Um, I, I found it interesting, can kind of see the evolution of the package that they had spec and then they're like, oh, that's a bad function name. And they went back and made specificity, which is just a wrapper around spec. Um, but the rest of them are a little bit less vague. Does anyone have any questions, thoughts, comments on the evaluation metrics? We might just blow through this, but there's I... <clears throat> Often need to remember which is which. So I find your nomics here helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried. Like, I, I don't usually remember them very well. I have to look up what do they mean. But I, you know, thinking of recall as remembering, well, number one, you have to think of like true positive as the only thing that 
kind of matters or for recall the actual or, actual positive the actual act yeah so true positive divided by um actual positive um yeah all of these like these terms this is one of those those things where like it makes me feel weak in stats it's like well yeah i know what recall is if i look it up <laughs> but um, there there was a comment in the book that i didn't feel confused until i read the comment <laughs> And then I went back. Okay, so it's on page 228. And it's this little scorpion warning box about false positive rate confusion. And it's, it's kind of like saying, oh, the, the word false positive rate is used in different ways sometimes. And that left me thinking, okay, so... So what are you telling me is the right way? And I couldn't find any clarification of that. <laughs> so like, I didn't think this was something I was confused about. <laughs> until they said, people use this term differently without any further clarification. So do you have any insight into that, into that comment? I feel like they're kind of saying, don't use that term instead use specificity or, or sensitivity and be specific about what you're meaning you're trying what you're trying to say um because okay they're saying sometimes it's the proportion of true negatives that test positive so that would be what does that mean the proportion of <laughs> actual negatives yeah so the proportion of no, no, no. The proportion of y yes. Wait, no. See, true negative <laughs> by definition tested negative, right? Our true negatives. I mean, so, that's what, that's what true think, negative means, right? It, it is negative and it tested negative. Right. Yeah. So if it's predicted negative and it's actually negative, that's true negative. Yeah. So the proportion of true negatives that test positive. Should be zero by definition. Do you yeah. think they mean? Do you think? Do they mean actual negatives? I think they mean actual negatives. I think they're saying um, a metric that isn't here, which would be false positive over um, true negative plus false positive. Yeah, so so kind of one so, minus specificity. So, John, is your question about the denominator for specificity? Well, it's about what do they mean in this little scorpion? Um, there, I yeah, think so, their warning is. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think also when you're saying, I, yeah, I think the actual negative is is what the denominator here, here is because true negative and then false positive, they both, the combination of these two, gives you, you know, people, yeah, you know, the results which should have been negative. Yep. So that's all those cases which are actually negative. So true negatives, which are actually negative and were to, you know predicted negative, and then false positive is something that was predicted positive but is actually negative. So it's the collection of the you know that that portion of the population which is actually negative. Right. Yeah. My so, my question, which I'm I was so I was I was just looking back, and and it seems a reasonable interpretation, John, to say that the scorpion is saying avoid this term false positive rate because it's used in different ways. Yeah, but then you know, when I had gone back to look at this on page two twenty two, and they give the picture of the confusion <laughs> matrix, they have this delightful sentence which I'll read to you. It says, "Where is it?" One important metric that is not explicitly called out in their diagram is the false positive rate. The end. The, and they don't, yeah. They say the mirror image, of, mirror image precision, of precision, which, which is, you know, that that could mirror image of precision is not a very precise way of specifying it. But so, so they're telling me on one hand that oh, this is an important metric, but we're not going to put it in the picture. Oh, and here's a scorpion just to warn you that people use this term differently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it would be, I think, <laughs> I think they're saying it's column two. So it'd be the true negatives divided by true negative plus false negative. 
is what they think false positive rate. Wait, but there's no false positive anywhere in there. <laughs> so, no, I, I was not at all confused by this <laughs> until, until yeah. they had to say, Oh, watch out, people use this term differently. <laughs> so, I mean, I think the one case of what does false positive rate mean could be one minus specificity, which comes up in a second. So, that would, but I, I agree, like, don't use that term, should be kind of the outcome here. Um, right. like that. I mean, also notice that we don't have true positive rate as <clears throat> one of the things defined here. So false positive rate, true positive I mean, rate, both are kind of... But you know, I mean, words like recall specificity, specificity and precision, you just have to remember what those mean with maybe, you know, helpful tricks. But it would be an improvement if we said something like false positive rate because that refers to it's a false positive. I mean, if, you, yeah. if, it, if the definition were in, inherent or like <laughs> suggested by the term. <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, I don't want to get stuck on this, but that, that was just one point where there was no confusion until I tell me <laughs> that it might be confusing. And then I yeah. went back and read it said more carefully. I'm like, you didn't tell me what to be confused or not confused about. Yeah. If I had not read anything and you asked me to define false positive rate, I am, what was it, wait, false negative? What, what were we talking about again? False positive rate, yeah. False positive rate. I would have said it's the percentage of all test positives that were false. That's, that's what I would have said. Like that, I mean, that's what the term suggests to me. But I don't, I don't believe that. Like, I don't know. Right. It could also be the number or false positives divided by total. Um, False positives divided by positives. False positives divided by false positive plus true negative. Yeah. Okay. So here's, um, another, here's another there you go. thing to throw in the works. <laughs> Your type one and type two errors are kind of related to this because the denominator changes when you're defining the type one and type two. So here's for another fun little wrench in the works. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, actually, it's funny that he they they don't bring in type one and type two errors again. I remember they talked about them before. And that's the one, again, I can only remember those by someone said, someone pointed out that in The Boy Who Cried Wolf, the townsfolk make a type one error and then a type two error. So they think there's a wolf and there isn't. There's a false positive, that's type one error. They think there isn't a wolf and there really is. That's a false negative, that's a type two error. Um, but I way prefer false positive, false negative, true positive, true negative as the terminology because it's much clearer what those mean. All right. So anyway, that's all the terminology. Um, you know, Yardstick defines them all in the functions that are named after them. So if you need a definition, that's an easy place to find them. All right. Um, <laughs> Rock curves, I, I always love, you know, like everything has to tell you what it means, but it means rock curve, like receiver operating characteristics doesn't really help you understand what it is. Um, it's because that's what it was in World War II when it was invented. Um, and the thing that just drove me crazy, I had to stare at it for a while of, wait, what's going on here? How does the one generated by Yardstick and the one in the book have a different uh, x-axis, it's because their x-axis is backwards. They have one on the left and zero on the right. And yeah, okay, that's a, a standard way to do it, but that's bad. Don't make charts like that. <laughs> um, anyway, so and that's... To be fair, they, they explicitly call it, out that it can be plotted it, both ways. Right, yes. But it just, it when I saw it, I was, it took me a second to, to understand why it was weird um, when I was basically creating the slides. Um, but the, the basic idea of a rock curve is it's showing you uh, visually how good your model is. Basically, like if it's perfect, there would be, it would be a square here and, um, but that's unlikely. So up here is the stuff that you're not quite getting right. Um, the area under the rock curve is used to score models because that's like, you know, how much of this is filled in. Um, and both of those are easy to to generate with uh, yardstick. Um, it's 
pretty much all I have on that. Does anyone have any other thoughts about rock curves? All right. Moving on. Lift. They barely touched on lift. And so I went in to Yardstick and was like, huh, I bet Yardstick can also auto-generate a lift curve. And it can, which they didn't show in the book. Um, I This is one where I am still trying to wrap my head around what I'm looking at, what this really means. Like um, the help, actually, and it, I have to submit a pull request to Yardstick because the help doc for this has some um, formatting problems that lose characters because it has uh, percents and greater thans and stuff and it was messing up the um, the help. But anyway, uh, like it talks about, you know, you want to know, like if you're doing direct mail, um, what percent, or actually I think the book might have also talked about direct mail, um, what percent of your customer base do you, or of your like potential customer base, do you have to send these direct mail things to, to get most of your positive cases? Um, but I, I'm still not really grokking how that's here. Like, is it one of those where we're kind of looking for the elbow? Like, stop here? I've maybe got a thought here that fits in the middle. Here's what you're looking at is uh, a generalization. But, but if you think about that direct mail example, where you've got a, um, I imbalanced truth set, right? So, right. so you've, you've got you got a very small target population, <laughs> but um, yeah, when you run GLM, your your classifier, you also get a column of preds, right? Know? So there's numbers in the class. In the numbers, you can choose a, di a cutoff different than 0.5. Yep. And by moving that dial, you move your uh, confusion matrix error from the, the uh, uh, say precision recall type mm -hmm. error to the other error, <laughs> that, that sliding scale. Um, I remember in um, class a couple of years ago, we would actually put costs on That's... each corner of the confusion matrix and run an optimization to get a optimal cutoff, most often not 0.5. So and, and lift was another way of, of looking for where that break is. Um, but, but I think a better way is, is economic costs. Yeah. Does, does that help? A little bit. Like I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the cost portion because that's where they did, they gave it like a paragraph. And I was like, that's, that is something I have never thought about when evaluating a model. And it, obviously like, it just makes sense to me. And so um, can I can I also before we get yeah. into cost too much? Yeah. Can I suggest a way of thinking about lift that I I this is the way that my mind naturally goes. Sure. All right. So you know, as you were saying, you know, you have you have a rare class of thing, right? It's like you're you're painting for gold. Right. Right. And there's some overall rate. Like in all the cases, let's just say there's a one percent occurrence of the rare class, you know, or point one or whatever. And I have a model that predicts uh, some probability. Like it's not just a, a one or zero prediction, it's you know, a certainty output. And so I take my model and then I, I sort all my cases, kind of like we do, John, you know, for people, they put the, the cases most likely to, to have something in them at the top and then yep. the cases at the bottom less likely. So lift is kind of like a concentration factor for a slice. So like a lift of three in the top decile is if I take the top 10% of my sorted list, what's the concentration of gold nuggets in that slice? If it's three times the base rate, that's a lift of three. So like lift is like lifting the concentration of the valuable thing. 
So okay. that's that's how I remember like lift. And when I was reading the book, I was like, oh, it's like, what? Because I'm I'm mining for gold. I want to increase the concentration of the thing I'm looking for. My model sorts things, and that's the like it lifts it. I guess it's like lifting it to the top of the list is kind of where lift comes from. But I think of it as increasing the concentration. That does help. And so, okay, so like this point is defined it, it, by definition. If you're looking at 100, percent then you get the base rate of one. one. It always yeah, goes down rate. to one bit. Yep. And then you know, past that, it's all. It depends on what's going on with your model. So it's useful to think if I had a perfect model, what would the lift model curve look like? And I think it would be like. Yeah. Um, Wouldn't it be flat? It, it would start really high. Like, I mean, the, the, the top fraction would be kind of like one over the base rate. You know, if it's one, okay. like the top, right, if it's right. 1% gold nuggets, then at the top would be 100 <laughs> because I sorted all the gold nuggets to the top. Okay. And, and at some point it would go down to one. Like, I don't, I'd have to think about the exact shape of that. Okay. That's helpful. Um, yeah. Okay. Like it, it's again, it's one of these things that I've kind of done this, but I don't understand <laughs> right. the, the, the uh, plot in, uh, inherently. So, all right. Um, before we get into cost, they, I, I have some definitions from the imbalanced data uh, section. These are relatively straightforward, but they talk about undersampling or downsampling where you take less of the, oh, and this is for that case where um, one of your classes, there's a, a lot fewer of. Um, fraud detection is one of the classic examples that hopefully in whatever system you might have, a very small percentage of them are actual fraud. And so if you have a model that's predicting fraud, the simplest model that's got really high accuracy is to predict it's not fraud. Just always predict it's not fraud. Most of the time you're right, but that's not a very good model. Um, that's where we're going to get into the cost stuff in a second because that matters. But all right, so undersampling is throw away some of your good, some of your uh, prevalent class. Um, I say it that way because it kind of points out the general flaw with that, that a lot of times you can't really afford to just throw away data. Um, and so the alternative to that is oversampling where you take the rare class and um, just copy it basically make more copies of it. Um, you can also up weight or down weight to do basically the same thing where you say some sample, you know, the um, the rare rare class is worth one and the um, prevalent class is worth one over the number of times that it appears or that kind of thing. Um, and then the other one is they talk about this smote algorithm to create uh, rare yeah, rare cases where what it's basically doing is um, mixing and matching features of the rare cases so that you can use them in modeling. Um, I didn't go, I didn't dive deep into like how any of that works. It's just, uh, it is there, it is an option and, uh, you know, Smode exists. In fact, I'm pretty sure, I think Smode is also in tidy models. Um, which, yep. yeah anyway so that's all that um, but what I just spent all my time thinking about <laughs> was this cost-based classification so instead of just using accuracy when you've got especially when you've got a rare case like this I, I don't know I think it's useful to think about even when it's not a rare case is think about um, what what does it matter if it's a false negative? How bad is that? If it's a false positive, how bad is that? Often that can be in money terms, but even if not, if you can put some sort of score on that, um, <laughs> that's what I just like got lost kind of pondering, um, because this seems like something like that's valuable to think about, even if you can't necessarily apply it, um can we put a value on you know how bad is it to have a false positive how bad is it to have you know what do we what do we lose when we have a false negative and what do we burn if we have a false positive um i feel like ai 
practitioners and people who deploy models need to be reminded of this a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I do. Um, I agree. Like, I, I feel bad for not thinking in these terms, almost. I mean, this, as an example, like, this reminds me of a discussion. So we had a hackathon at our company, you know, last weekend or you know, the end of last end week. End of last week, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one of the teams was thinking along the lines of cheating detection, you know, flagging students that are, that are cheating. And I, I kind of tried to steer them away from that. Like, cause part, you think about the cost, like think about terms of false negatives and false positives. The, if, if, a, if like detecting a cheater is a positive and a false positive comes with an enormous cost. <laughs> if, we, if we flag a student as cheating and they're not, like there's a very good chance we lose that adoption because the student gets indignant, he complains bitterly, and the professor's like, "Whoa, you guys!" You know, like, I mean, there's a chance we get sued at that point. Right? Like, so, there's a yeah. huge <laughs> cost to a false yep. positive there, and there's very, very little cost to a false negative <laughs> to us, at least, right? right? <laughs> like, and so you know, there's almost no model we can deploy other than the nobody's cheating model that is worth it. <laughs> Right, like, I mean, that's a case where you would have to do like absolutely 100% perfect to make it even worth it to consider. And even in that case, you wonder like, is it worth deploying? <laughs> right, yeah, we've had cases where, you know, an instructor su suspects cheating. And so we help provide evidence for, right. you know, for or but, against yeah, that. Like, but it, that's different them, from us coming accusation. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, that's that is a good um, example, and that's where just thinking out the false negative cost, the false positive cost, without necessarily applying it in your model. I mean, I love the idea of, of using it as your accuracy measurement, but if you can't do that, um, just thinking about it can be super helpful. And like I said, this was like a paragraph, I guess, kind of two paragraphs in the book, and I read it and just like kind of stared into space for a while because it's like, man, I had never really formally thought about that. And the idea of building it into um, accuracy measurements seems like a really good idea if you can make it work. And I think I want to play around with that some. For, like, it's worth thinking about because a lot of things it's like, well, does it like how, what matters about this model? <laughs> like, what happens if we say something is, and a lot of times it's not necessarily false negative, but it'd be, you know, in the wrong class um, out of a multi-class. How far it is from the, wrong, from the right class can matter. And so that's where we do a lot of um, measurements that aren't really talked about in here, um, like Cohen's Kappa. Um, but yeah, it's... That, so yeah, that was, that was that. Does anyone else have any thoughts, examples? Um, because I found this really interesting. Um, and I think that's all. Yeah, that's all I have notes wise. Um, it was another. It was another good chapter. I, you know, like just getting that just for that paragraph. I think the chapter was worth it for me. <laughs> Does anyone else have any? I don't know any nuggets, any thoughts about the, uh, the chapter. Um, one thing that is, you know, useful, they do have the, the part that I don't really have a slide about, but they talk about, um, like, look at your data, look at, look at your model, explore it visually. And, um, you know, as I was building, uh, these, I was reminded that tidy models is full of auto plot functions to help you easily just kind of look at your model. Um, how to, what does it do? <laughs> like how do different things impact it all that kind of thing and so um that is useful like uh yeah <laughs> hi john yeah um please can you um interpret again the rock curve um sure. yeah 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 okay just i want an explanation how it works yeah all right so 
um, first, so we're looking at sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is recall. Um, so again, of the true positives, um, or of, yeah, of the actual positives, how many did you flag? How many did you see? So um, did you find 0% of them or 100% of the actual positives? And then specificity is um, how many of the true negatives did you find? So um, basically, you want to find all of the true negatives. You want to find all the true positives. And the the curve is like your ratio of those. Um, and the kind of this area in the curve, I actually almost wish it went all the way. It didn't have the extra little zeros on here because you want to you're aiming at this top corner trying to get all the way up to that corner and this piece missing piece is how much you're missing um, and so that's where the area under the rock curve this is used as a measurement of your model if the area is one you, you're perfect if the area is 0 0.5 you're random if the area is less than 0 0.5 then you should reverse your model and then you'll be above 0 0.5 um, I think it's worth mentioning like that to walk along the curve, you're dialing a cutoff. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yep. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Actually, what, what does that mean? What the last sentence that John said? <laughs> so, so like, um, if you, so your model puts out a probability, like, you know, you know, somewhere between zero and one, and you get to set a cutoff, which you know by default we might think of as 0.5. It's above 0.5. I say it's you know in the class below that not, but I can dial that you know, as Jim was saying. You know you can pick cutoffs that are not 0.5. I could pick a cutoff that's um, zero, and just say no, everything's in the predicted class. Okay, and what what would the sensitivity for that be? If I say everything's in the predicted class, like I get everything, right? I get 100% because, hey, every everything that was an actual positive, I predicted to be positive because I predicted everything to be positive. So <laughs> if I put my cutoff at zero, I get 100% sensitivity. But I, then I get, I guess, zero specificity right? because I didn't pick out any negatives. And so that would put me at the very top right there. So like, yeah, I can get 100% sensitivity at the cost of 0% specificity just by putting my cutoff at the very bottom. On the other hand, I could put my cutoff at 100, like 101, and then I say, well, I'm just going to say nothing's in the class. And that gets me a 0% sensitivity because I have no positives at all, so no true positives. But I have everything's negative, so I have 100% specificity. And so that puts me at the bottom left. And as I move my cutoff between zero and one, I am at different points along that curve. Any other questions or thoughts about about rock? Um. Also, um, another question is. When do we um one can actually choose whether to use accuracy or a curve? Um, I mean, my th my feeling on that is basically accuracy is quick and easy, but rock is usually well, AUC is usually more informative. Um, because accuracy, one thing that accuracy really fails at is taking into account um like the 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 how frequent things are um if you know it's that case like i said where if you um if 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 there's hardly any positives and so you just always say negative you'll be you might be like 99 percent accurate um but that that accuracy doesn't really mean anything <laughs> because uh you know it's not it it's not the you're not actually catching the things in the model versus your rock curve it would show that at least to some degree um 
and and like one important thing flat, but yeah, accuracy yeah. also depends on the cutoff you pick right like you're yeah. saying john like you know if you pick a model with a cutoff of zero or you know one you might get a great accuracy but you have to like you have to pick a particular value of cutoff to calculate accuracy whereas the advantage of the rock curve and the AUC is that it's a summation, a, sum, a summary overall possible cutoffs that you pick. Right. That's, yeah, that's a really good way to look at it. Um, sorry, I have a question on the logistic regression. I think me and oh, I have yeah. covered it last week, um, but talks about the threshold that 0 0.5 threshold. Um, is there a way to change that in tidy model? Uh, maybe it's a tidy model in question, but like, you know, in a tidy models ecosystem, how do I change that cutoff? The answer to the, is there a way? Yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, I don't recall. Uh, hmm. Um, because that would be in your that would be in predict. Probably, and so where do you say that? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Like, yes, there is, and I know I've done this. It's. It's when you. I mean, it might just be in the general predict. Uh. Um. I know I've done this and now I can't. Um, I can't think of it and I can't find it real quick off the top of my head, but where I, I would look for it in when you are actually doing the predict, because that's where you're going to decide, you know, how to, how to do the cutoff. And it's an argument in there and I've done this, but now I can't find, I can't remember the argument. Um, but it's, and at that point, it's not really a tidy models thing. It's a, it's just part of LM and the predict method for LM. You, you unmuted Jim. Do you have a thought? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Yeah. My, my, I hit a cord and my computer went down. Oh, um, Julia Silgi has uh, a, a way in Yardstick to write a custom optimization function. I, I, I guess in a business context, I go right into um, costs and, you know, along the lines of mean log loss, I, I, I write my own Yardstick function to optimize for, and that yields a different cutoff than 0.5. Okay. Is that the RMSLE that she wrote a couple, a couple weeks ago? That, 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 that's right. Uh, two, three weeks ago, there, there was a very helpful um, segment that um, vastly condenses my workflow from <laughs> what I'd been doing before um, as post-processing. And, and, uh, but yeah, this principle of costs for misclassification is a big deal in a in a business environment or in a, with a client, I guess, you know, forcing them to say, when, when you put people in these different boxes, what happens and, and, and getting to optimize for exactly that um, is, is so critical that, that, that it ends up being, yeah, yeah, yes, in fact, a, a, a unique uh, yardstick function. Cool. Um, and I think there is, a, did she have a blog or video about that? Well, I, I, blog, a blog post for sure. Um, okay. 
Yeah, I think, I think it was it, a sliced it, problem one time. From a sliced problem, yeah. Right, okay, yep. I, I think her focus was imbalanced classes, um, which, which is always the case. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and then some um, machine lear learning algorithms give you the whole continuum just automatically and, and other things um, and, and others uh, don't. <laughs> so when you're using um, GLM or um, 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 regularized re regression, sometimes you get these things for free. Um, other times you've got to redo the, 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 the whole machine learning process. But ultimately, the, the, the point is that um, tuning the cutoff is, is, is really got to be part of the workflow to get, to get a result that the, 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 the client can accept. Right. Oops. All right. Anything else? Uh, speaking of the rare class and imbalanced classes, it reminded me of a point that I was a little puzzled by in one of the book examples. This is so on page 232, 233 ish around there. They have their, yeah, in the pages before, they have an example data set of. Uh, loan defaulting. Right. I hate these examples. I wish they had find some other things to use. But anyway, <laughs> so they're trying to predict whether a given loan will be in default. Right. And okay, I'm trying to find out where all right, in the full data set, this is on page 231, they have a data set where about 20%, 19% of the loans are going to be in default. That's in the training data, which is unbalanced enough that if they just train on the data as is, then their model predicts like pretty much nothing is in default because it's a rare enough class, right? So only 0.39% of the loans are predicted to be in default in the first model they, they train, which is way, way below you know, the actual default rate. Then they have this oversampling, up, down, waiting thing, blah, blah, blah. And then on the top of page 233, it has the mean of the predicted values is now about 58% instead of 0.39%. Now, I, I understand that sentence to be this new model predicts 58% of the loans to be in default rather than, again, 19%. This, now, to me, this doesn't seem great. Like, does that, does that, is anyone else disturbed by this, this model that now predicts, like, Oh, about a three times default rate. Like, and they just go, I mean, and then it, they don't discuss that at all, but that, that seems like really worrisome. I'd be, I'm more concerned by this new model than by the old one. <laughs> at least the old one, like kind of gives everybody loan indiscriminately and the bank eats the cost. <laughs> it, right. Am I, am I misreading the sentence here? I mean, I think that is part of why they go into the cost-based uh, uh, barely. Why, why they touch they on the cost they base? Don't it. Like they just I know. say, it. Like, "Oh, look, this new." They kind of like, "Hey, this new model's better now," and they kind of move on. <laughs> it was funny because as I was reading, I explicitly like noticed that I was like, "Huh, I don't remember what that number was," but that doesn't seem right. And it no, just kind of kept awful. on going. When you, when you think about it, it's awful. <laughs> yeah, it's they definitely didn't tune. Basically, it's like you want to be somewhere in between those two. Uh, options clearly. It it seems there may be domains where waiting is appropriate, but um, but but not with bank loans. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's I, there 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 may be other scientific domains where that's that's good enough. But right, but, um, yeah. Um, it is kind of funny that they didn't well, like generate an example <laughs> where what they're trying to show actually works. Um. <laughs> I mean, I mean, and, and just the way they're describing it is like we're trying to get a model that predicts default and not default with roughly equal probabilities. Like, why? I mean, maybe, exactly. maybe on your your artificially balanced training data, you want that. But when you're running it on presumably unbalanced test data, right? Or like real world data, no, you don't want that. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I was yeah that that 
that metric that they're using in this section just after the section about metrics is a fairly meaningless metric and that's kind of funny um like why didn't they show the metrics for the two models and show us which metal <laughs> model is better using auc <laughs> um that is interesting so uh yeah, and, and I agree that, you know, they always use loans and like, you know, you're talking about the costs on the loan and it's like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Now I'm trying to, uh, you know, my classification models are classifying things into, you know, different subjects or different topics or whatever. Do you have an example of calculating cost on that? Because I don't and I do it for a living, you know, <laughs> like that's, <laughs> loans are easy to calculate cost on, but. I, I like the idea and I, I really want to try, but um, yeah. Yeah, multi-class is super hard. To, yeah. To wrap your mind around because there's there's always minority classes where things will fall through. Yeah. Yeah, we have um, definitely, you know, like some of it, you know, they talk about data generation. Um that's actually a totally separate book that I have to read is the human in the loop machine learning where my data generation for the rare classes is, Hey, can you find some of these <laughs> and, and label them? <laughs> so, and you know, realist or really it is, okay, I'm going to give you all the ones that I, that have any chance of being that. And can you tell me which ones actually are that? And then we can improve the, the labels in our training data. Um, so that is actually, that that's a whole separate thing, but, uh, getting people involved to label the ones that you're missing can help. My, my, my preference is to direct clients into making two different questions. Yeah. Um, be, because um, then, then you don't have an all encompassing one algorithm, 16 mm -hmm. or 32 or a hundred classes. You, you've got one series of questions <laughs> for certain things with their own critical cost uh, matrix and then a different set of questions with a different cost matrix and 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 so leading the client or the the non-practitioner to to ask the right question is is so important here yeah for sure all right well with that i think uh that pretty much wraps up the chapter so does anyone before we hop off anyone want to volunteer for uh the the machine learning chapter. This is K nearest neighbors, tree models, uh, bagging in random forest, and boosting. Um, I think it's going to be fun. It's it is. We are getting into two chapters here um, where I am interested at the connection between all the stats stuff we've been going over and these things. Like this probably isn't the best book to learn about, like how to run XGBoost, for example, but learning about um, kind of the statistical uh, look at it will be interesting to see. Um, yeah, if nothing else, I'll just make Jonathan do it. So uh, <laughs> we'll figure it out. Okay, so we needed volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll talk in the chat. Oh. John, is this next week or the week after that? Next week, I'm really swamped, but I could do it the week after. Well, tell you what, um, let's talk in the chat. Let's. Uh, I feel like this is going to be more of a summary chapter than a really deep dive chapter, but I, want, I need to look at it. I don't know if it's a one a one week chapter or a two week chapter, and I wouldn't want to split it um, right away. But we'll we'll start sorting it out. As, let's like let's all read the chapter and see where we get. Um, maybe we'll do kind of a an overview next week and a deeper dive the following week. I don't know. We'll see. I need to see what it is. I don't know what's in the chapter really yet. Uh, if not, then maybe we'll have you do chapter seven. Sounds. All right. We will talk on the Slack. <laughs>